everybody say thank you, Lord, for a yes. full house. Thank Hallelujah. Full Come house. on. Put your hands Man, up. Put your antennas up tonight and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says lift up the hands that hang down. Amen. Lifting up holy hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Worship Him. Amen. And the beauty of holiness, just worship God and magnify Him and thank Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your presence tonight. Lord, we just give you honor and praise and glory. Hallelujah. We are thankful to be able to come into the house of the Lord. There are many, many people all over this world that cannot worship God freely. They cannot come into a place like we have tonight, Sister Janice. They're in undergrounds and places, and they're afraid for their life that somebody's going to come in and, and, and just take what, what little bit they have. The, the pe a lot of people do not even have Bibles all over this world. Millions of people don't have Bibles. And think about, in your home alone, how many Bibles do you have just in your home? But there's millions of people that don't even have a Bible to read. And so they, in one place I, I, I read about that what they were doing is they couldn't pass all the Bibles, so they would just tear sheets out of their Bible, and they would just pass it on to somebody else and give it to them. And they would treasure that, that little page in the Scripture. They would just hold on to it. That's all they had. And they would just read that and just hold that Scripture. And when I think about how many Bibles we have, you know, how, how many I have and how many we would uh, corporately have together, it's just awesome to me, and I appreciate that. But there, we have to also be mindful of the people who do not have. Amen. And be thankful. Just be thankful. God is good. Amen. Be thankful. We are uh, living in troubled times, and we are uh, need to have our whole armor on at all times. But we, uh, we need to know that we're also living in a good time. Hallelujah. Because we are going to be the generation that sees the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to see the coming of the Lord. I've, I've heard about it all my life. And we're going to, it's coming quick. Amen. And, and we're going to see that. Hallelujah. I believe I'm going to see that. Glory to God. And I see it in the spirit. Hallelujah. But I believe I'm going to see that. People that, that long to be in the day that we are right now. Uh, the day of, of grace, people have longed to be there. And we're here, hallelujah. So we need to give praise to the Lord on that. Uh, what we want to talk about tonight, um, I'm, going, I'm on the subject that I've been on and I guess will still be on right on until Jesus comes uh, uh, because it's what I believe God's called me to. And uh, there was um, many uh, things that I've preached on and many scriptures that I've read, but probably over... I would say about 40 years ago when the Lord had spoke to me at a little uh, Bible prayer meeting that we were having it was actually at a lady's house that had been healed of cancer and we were there and um, she wanted to, the ladies to come and just have a service in her home and I was playing the piano there and they didn't have a whole lot of music going on but uh, singing and playing and the people that was there and she had been healed of cancer she had had cancer and all of her hair had fallen out a lot of things had happened but her hair she said look it's growing back i mean just tremendous things was happening but the lord impressed on me then 40 years ago to he said go tell i was sitting at the piano and i could hear him say to me go tell my people that i love them go tell them that i love them everything hinges on whether or not you believe god loves you or not so we want to talk about that tonight. I want to talk about overcoming fear and pride with love, with the love of God. Um, I want to say a few things before we go into the scripture. But the bigger that God is to you, however big God is to you, and the more revelation you have on His great love, and the Bible speaks of great love, great love, and His great grace, the less fearful you will be. Uh, the only way to combat fear is with love. You cannot just pray fear away from someone that's not sure how God thinks about them or feels about them. If they're uncertain about the love of God, you might be able to come against the spirit of fear while you're there. Are you listening to me? 
while you're there. But when you leave, that spirit's going to come back because you can't stop spirits from, from tormenting people. Uh, you can do a lot of things in your, uh, while they're in your presence. But if people tolerate the mindset that they're not certain if God loves them, then fear is going to come. And we need to know that. So we want to uh, be, we don't want to, want to be a fearful people. We don't want to be a people full of pride. Um, we, we don't want to be um, people that are, we don't understand. The Bible says we need to understand how much God loves us. So I want to go to several scriptures tonight. We're going to be in in uh, First John. We're going to be in uh, Ephesians. And I'm not exactly sure... Uh, how far we're going to get tonight on this, but we'll take it as far as we can. First, I want to go to Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 3, and I want to, uh, let's look at this, and then we're going to be uh, also in that same chapter, uh, Brother Keith, we're going to be 17 and 18. I want to read that also. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and then Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing. Another translation says, All and every kind of spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. He said that we're already blessed. Amen. Somebody say, Already. I'm already blessed. Hallelujah. We need to know that. If we don't know that, we're going to ask the Lord, I just need you to bless me, Brother Donald. And God is saying, I've already blessed you. I need you to believe it. So when He, when God says, uh, I've already blessed you, what is your response? What is your faith response to, uh, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessing? You lift up your hands and say, thank God that I've been blessed with all spiritual blessing and heavenly places in Christ. That's our faith response. Do you know if we just let that sit there, it'll sit there? You know, your Bible will not get up off the table and come in there to where you are uh, in the dining room and open up and, and show you where to read. But and when you read something in the Scripture, if you don't grab it and say, I believe that, I receive that, it just sits there on the pages. We have to take it by faith and say, God says I'm blessed. So I am, Brother Keith, blessed. Amen. That means I'm empowered to prosper by Christ. Amen. And I need to know that. And this was one of the things that the, that the church at Ephesus did not know. They, they, had, they was rich in all kind of different things, and, and they were... Uh, all kind of things that God had blessed them with, but they did not know how much God loved them. You know, uh, you can be blessed in all kind of ways, and God be pouring out things, and but you you don't know that God loves you. When you go to bed at night, you're not sure what your relationship is with God, how He feels about you, what He thinks about you. You're not going to be at peace. It don't matter what you have. You won't be at peace. Only knowing who you are in Christ and how much He loves you is going to bring the peace that you and I need. All right, in verse 17 and 18, that the God, this is a part of the prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of what? Wisdom. We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, now go to Ephesians chapter 3. And let's look at verse 17. Ephesians 3 and 17. This is so important. Hallelujah. Amen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. How is he going to do it? By faith that we can say that you, or you can say me, myself, being rooted and grounded in what? In love, rooted and grounded. Boy, that says something to me. We're not talking surface stuff here. Rooted and grounded in love. I want to uh, camp here just for a minute. That word uh, rooted means below and under. It means support. It means the basis and the essential core. Rooted and grounded. If you don't, if something doesn't have root, it'll die, right? When Jesus spoke to that tree that it wasn't going to uh, bear anything anymore, no figs forever, nobody would ever eat from that tree, it began to die. 
And so whether it, the root system or whatever happened, it started to affect everything else. Because if it doesn't have any root to it, it's going to die. So if we're not rooted in the love of God, if we don't take time to get rooted in the love of God, get uh, the essential core under and have the support of the love of God in our life, we're not going to be able to move on. Uh, a lot of people try to move on in ministry and they try to move on in their personal life, but they don't know that God loves them. So Sister Linda, every time something happens, that question comes up. Well, I wonder if this happened because... I did so and so. I wonder if this happened because I didn't do something exactly right. Not knowing that the devil was sending things their way and that God's opinion of them had not changed at all and that he loves us. Amen. And he loves them. I think it's interesting, and we're going to go to these scriptures, but at least five times in the book of John, John referred to himself by inspiration of the Holy Ghost that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. Not the disciple that loved Jesus. There have been so many people that stood up and said, when we testify, what is the usual thing you've heard through the years when they had testimony service? They talked about how much they love the Lord, right? They stood up and I just want, I just want to say how much I love the Lord, how much I love the Lord. But how many times have you heard people stand up and testify, I just want to talk about how much God loves me. Come on. If you sat there and you listened to it, there's been very few times because people would say, well, who do they think they are? If they stand up and say, I want to talk about how much God loved me. I want to talk about his life that he gave for me. I want to talk about how much Jesus loves me. And they're thinking about, well, you're, you're being prideful. But you know, that is the highest form of, of humility is to talk about how much God loved you because you had nothing to do with it. You couldn't do anything to make God love you. That is really humility. It is pride to stand up and talk about how much you love God. And people have gotten that backwards. Uh, talking to someone earlier today about a song, the title I think was Surely I Will. And there was uh, a popular song uh, a number of years ago. And one of the lines in the song says, if working and praying has any reward, then surely some morning I'll see my dear Lord. Because he's talking about himself, about what I've done. If anybody's going to, he said, if anybody makes it, surely I will. That's pride. Come on, that's pride. We need to say, I'm making it because of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. All the, all the, everything needs to be pointing to Christ. Hallelujah. And a lot of times people have pointed it to themselves. Hallelujah. Rooted and grounded. All right, when we talk about, uh, we're going to go a little bit further on this, but let me do this part right here. When it says grounded, and I thought this was really good, grounded is mentally and emotionally stable. Mentally and emotionally stable, sensible and unpretentious. We need to be rooted and grounded, mentally and emotionally stable in the love of God. How much God loves us. Now let's go to verse 18 and 19, um, Brother Keith, on this. 18 and 19. Paul is praying, and when he says, starts out in, in ver, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, this is to the church of Ephesus, but to all them in Christ, right? He's talking to all of us. He's talking to Wings of Love Ministry right now. That we may, that I may, you may, be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height Next verse, and to know, that word know is, is like Adam knew Eve, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. How are you going to know it? It's not talking about here, Brother LJ, not talking about in the mental realm. It's talking about knowing the love of Christ in your heart, being rooted and grounded in your heart, which passes knowledge. Why do we need this rooted and grounded relationship with God? Because we cannot be filled 
with all the fullness of God until we get rooted and grounded in the love of God. This is foundational. Hallelujah. If we don't know how much God loves us, we will not be able to receive everything that God has for us. Whether it's healing, whether it's prosperity, whatever it is, it will all, Brother Jerry, go back on the, uh, the point of whether I deserve it, whether or not I've done enough to get it. If we don't get this, and he's saying, I'm praying that you get this, because if you don't get this, you won't be able to get all these other things. All the things that God wants us to be filled, and, and that blows my mind. When I look at that scripture, I don't know how you feel about it, being filled with all the fullness of God, of who He is? Is that possible, Sister Linda? God said it was. We can be filled. How many of you feel like you're filled with all the fullness of God? I don't feel like I've been filled with all the fullness of God yet because I've got some revelation, but I only have, a, I have part of a revelation. I don't have enough revelation. Being filled with all the fullness of God of everything that that God is and everything that God has done, everything that God will do uh, for me on behalf of Christ, hallelujah, uh, because when we get rooted and grounded, that's when the next step comes. And so many people have said, well, why don't I have this or why don't haven't I experienced that? But they haven't, Sister Janice, got rooted and grounded in the love of God yet. And God is saying through the Apostle Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is saying, you've got to settle that first. You've got to get rooted and grounded in the love of God before you can go any further. Now, I want us to go to Ephesians 1. I don't believe you read this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, did we do Ephesians 1, 17? I want to go 17 through 23. I want to take it a little bit further. We're going to go back and recap this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Keep going. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of of his inheritance in the saints. I want you to notice right there, the eyes of your understanding. You're not talking about these. Sister Neil, you're not talking about these. He's talking about the eyes of your heart, being able to comprehend from your heart what is the exceeding greatness of his power. God wants us to know that. He wants you to comprehend that. To usward who believe, exceeding greatness of his power. To usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Keep going which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Amen. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Amen. And have put all things where? Under his feet. Where is, the, where is the feet of Christ? The feet of Christ is the church because your feet are in your body and we are the body of Christ. So he's put all things under the feet of the church and gave him, Christ, to be the head, amen, over all things to the church. Glory to God, which is his body. Glory to God, the fullness of him that dwelleth. All in all. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise God. Somebody lift their hands and praise the Lord tonight. Glory to God. Say, Lord, I thank you. I worship you. I magnify you. Hallelujah. God, you're good. God, he wants us so feel. Uh, Brother LJ was talking about some things, and I'm going to cover something that he said because he didn't realize it, but when he talked, and preached on Sunday, if he could have seen page two of my notes, it would have looked just like his. I mean, awesomeness the way where God has us. But the question would be this, when we study and be rooted and grounded in the love of God, and we realize that whether God loves us is not in question. 
we don't, a lot of people say, well, I don't know how God feels about me now that I've done so and so. There have been many people that's went the wrong direction. They've got off the road that they shouldn't path they should have been on. They may have gotten away from God for years and they don't know how God feels about them. Exactly the same way that he always has. Never changed his mind. God never deals with a believer, even if he's a fallen believer, as if he's never been saved. He never deals with him any other way than a believer. And we need to know that because that's what the scripture tells us. So what happens is because people think that God has changed his opinion about them, they go by their feelings that God's changed his opinion. Well, I know God doesn't feel the same way he used to. They're going by their feeling. They're not going by this book. They're not going by what God said. Because God said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I've loved you with an everlasting love, one that's never going to fail. We need to tell people, Brother Donald, no matter how far they think they are away from God, God has not changed his mind about them, and the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. And to tell them, look, they might be your opinion, but that's not God's opinion. So many people are like, well, Lord, I just uh, like the prodigal son. They, ha they hold that opinion. And, and I'll just go back and tell my daddy that I'm willing to be a hired servant because I'm not worthy to be his son. And the fact of the matter remains that the father was looking for his son. He wasn't looking for a servant. He had servants. He wanted his son. And when he came back, what did he do? He killed the fatty calf, threw a party, put a ring on his finger, put a cloak uh, across his shoulders, and reinstated him. Hallelujah. And let him know it was about the love of the father. So we need to understand that's how God feels about us. He is not saying, well, we've got to do penance. Uh, I've heard people say, well, when you come back to the Lord, you have to prove yourself. I've heard people say that. You have to prove yourself. In other words, when you come back to God, if you've been away and you've been away from the church for a while, then you need to sit down and you need to listen and you need to prove that you're sincere. What they really mean is you need to show us that you're repentant enough to be back in the place where you used to hold when really they need to be back up on the platform and they need to just continue on. Come on, we need to, people have got so many religious stuff going on and so much tradition that they're forgetting about the word, that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God never changes his mind. We don't need, need to skip a beat. They don't need to uh, insert uh, denominations. They put them on a year probation. Within the, within the organization, you're on a year of probation. You can't preach for a year. You can't hold an office. You can't do certain things. Who do we think we are when the Word of God does not do that? Where he does not put somebody on probation. Okay, you, then, then you can't be uh, up there singing or playing or playing music or do anything like that. That's not what God said. And God, the whole reason that God created man was for fellowship and for family and he wants to be close to us. And I think, Sister Linda, we need to establish that. We need to establish how much God loves man and what kind of relationship he really does want with man. You say, well, some people, I want to cover this tonight because I believe it's important. And I have to, uh, in other words, ask the question to get there, I guess. How close do you want to be to God? The scripture tells us how close God wants to be to you, right? The scripture tells us how much he loves us with an everlasting love. He's not withdrawing. He's not pulling. He said, if you'll draw nigh to me, what did he say? I'll draw nigh to you. Uh, he's not wanting a distant relationship with us. So the question would be, how close do we want to be to God? But all of that is based on how close we think God wants us to be to him. Because... We're not going to draw to God if we think God's mad at us. We're, we're not going to come up close to Him or sit up in His lap or, 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 or you know, love on Him if we think He's mad at us, if He's holding something against us. Uh, there, there were multitudes, and I'll talk about this in following Christ, but there were multitudes that followed Jesus. But then there were numbers, and I want to talk about that. Uh, we can't turn there tonight for sake of time. But God is wanting a close relationship with us. What he was wanting at the church at Ephesus and what he wants at Wings of Love and throughout 
and for us to know how much he loves us, and Jesus was the proof of that. Um, the cross is the proof of how much. People say, well, how do I know God loves me? Look at the cross. All you have to do is look at the cross, look at the pain, look at the crucifixion, look at what God was willing to pay for you, and then you'll know how much God loves you. Who else loved you like that? Who else gave, who else, you, who else do you know that would give their only son for you? To be crucified. Does anybody know anybody that would do that? I wouldn't do it. I don't know of anybody that would do that other than God, but God did. Hallelujah. And he, the Bible says he commended that love toward us and, look, and looking at the cross. So there were 70. And I want to, uh, in Luke 10, we can't go there, but when you get opportunity, I want you to go read that that there were 70 people that Jesus sent out two by two in the area of ministry, 70 people. They were multitudes that followed him, but they were 70 that he sent out. Now, from that 70, he chose 12. There were 12 uh, apostles or disciples, and they become apostles, he, were, were chosen. But then, out of that 12, he chose three that you hear about a lot. Who was that? Peter, Peter, James, and John. Those were the three that was in a closer uh, kind of uh, uh, part with him in ministry. In fact, when he would go in places, all the, some of the other disciples were not going in there, but Peter, James, and John did. Right, a core group. So he, you go from 70 to 12 to 3, and then from the 3, there was one that was closer yet. Who was that? That was John. Now, from that, it wasn't that Jesus did not want to be close to everybody. It's just some recognized how much he loved them, and they literally stayed with him and approached him because they knew they could. From that, John is referred uh, to many uh, Bible scholars, but he referred to it himself, but he was referred to as the disciple of love. John referred to himself as one that Jesus loved. I want us to look at those scriptures if we could. Let's go to the book of John and um, let's start. Um, let's, we're going to be all over, but I want to get all these in uh, John chapter 20, verse 2. And just ask yourself some things in here. Now, it said, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, what? Whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the, the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. This was John writing by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He referred to himself. It was Peter and John there, the disciple that Jesus loved. Is that right? All right, look at John 21 and 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved, there again, uh, following, which also, what did he do? Leaned on the breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? He was leaning on the breast. Now, it would be hard for me, for Brother Jerry, you know, to lean against one another because he's on one side of the table and I'm the other. But back in those days, they reclined at a, a low table. They kind of sat on, I guess, little pillow things or whatever. And their feet was kind of out to the side. And John, don't you think about it, John was leaning on the breast of Jesus. He was leaning on his chest. Is that close? Somebody say, that's close. Hallelujah. Amen. That's close. So 21 and 20, he's saying he was, he was one that disciple that Jesus loved. There again, he's not saying how much he loves Jesus. He's saying how much Jesus loves him. Because until you get that, and that until you get settled and rooted and grounded in that, you can't even respond back to Jesus with love if he doesn't put love inside of you. Hallelujah. Until we get revelation. John 21 and 7. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, here we go again, saith unto Peter, 
Now, that's not pride. This is humility. We understand this is humility, not pride. He ain't saying, I'm the only one Jesus loved. He recognized Jesus loved him. Unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, didn't have on that, and did cast himself into the sea. Just think about these. Think about John 13, 23. Let's go there. This, I'm going to give you five. Amen. 13, 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, what? Whom Jesus loved. Who is that? <coughs> That's John. Go to John 19, 26. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, amen, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Now, John was there in the beginning, and John was the only one there at the cross, at the end. John was the only one that was there. He was the only one that, that didn't just, just go another direction. He was still there. He was leaning on the breast of Jesus. He was still there. And he repeatedly referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, right on up to being there. And he was the one that took the mother of Jesus after the crucifixion and after Jesus died. He took the mother of Jesus into his home as his own mother. Now, I want you to think about something, because this is really awesome to me. He was referring to himself. Now, we know Jesus loved them all. Jesus loved the world. The disciples, all the same. But one had a revelation that Jesus loved him. Man, it made a huge difference in his life. Amen? It is a fact, and this is what kind of, I don't want to throw you sideways, but I want you to grab hold of this. I think it'll help you. It is a fact that everybody doesn't love God the same. Um, it is true that God loves everybody the same. But it's also true that everybody doesn't know how much God loves them. One may stand up, we'll say, John, back here may stand up, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. He's not being arrogant. We all should be saying, I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. I'm, I'm the child. I'm his favorite child. We are be all saying, I'm, I'm God's favorite. We are. We, we need to know that we are individually all of God's favorite. However, everybody doesn't love God the same. Some just love God, and this is just a fact, some people love God more than other people love God. It's just a fact. This is not God's choice. It's theirs. It's their own choice. Some people... Uh, they follow God afar off. They, they, you know, they, they don't want to go to hell. You know, I'm going to get saved. I don't want to go to hell. But they don't have the commitment. They don't, they don't really know. And I believe the reason they're not filled with all the fullness of God is, uh, Brother Billy, they never got rooted and grounded in how much God loved them. That was what was keeping them from being filled with all the fullness of God. They never got rooted and grounded. That revelation of God's love changes everything. When you get revelation, not talking about information, not talking about memorization. I'm not talking about being able to quote the scripture. I'm talking about getting up every morning of your life and say, Lord, I'm I'm the disciple that you love. I'm your favorite. I'm getting up and referring to yourself as the favorite of God. I am God's favorite. Have you ever have you ever got up just in the morning and said, I am the favorite of God. Hallelujah. And begin to wave your hands and, and say, thank you, Lord, that I'm your favorite. I'm the disciple that you love. Because people have been geared to believe, and we'll say it again, that that's arrogance. But it's not. It's revelation knowledge. It's biblical truth to refer to yourself that way because God refers to you as his beloved. It does he not? Amen. So we need to refer to ourselves the way God does and get revelation. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brother LJ uh, preached, um, and I'm going to say a piece of my message, and if you see my notes, you'll see what I'm talking about. 
I'm so glad he did because it was one scripture that I didn't read and I sat here and, and watched him read it and I said, thank you, Lord. Uh, a piece of the message on Sunday night that God had given me that I didn't get around to for time and it was Leviticus 7 and 30 and I want us to go there again because he was talking about feeding on Christ and that is so important. Hallelujah. People have got... Um, they got things mixed up. They think that if they can do everything right and, and uh, Sister Janice, they don't do anything wrong, then God would love them. That's not the way it is. God started this thing out and he loved us from the beginning and we need to find out just how much he loves us. Hallelujah. Amen. Said his own hands shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire, the fat with the breast, and it shall be... Uh, it shall be bring that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. Now, we know from Scripture, we keep reading. Remember, he was talking about the wave offering. He was talking about, talking about the perfect picture of the cross. That Aaron ate the breast. And in order to eat the breast, we need, according to Scripture, we need to feed on the breast because the breast always represents the love of Christ. The breast represents the love. And we're to feed on the love of Jesus. And most people feed uh, Brother Jerry on their problems or on their uh, shortcomings. And they're, they're caught up with that. They're, and have you noticed that people that are, that are condemning of themselves, they also find fault with everybody else too? It's all about what we've all done wrong. And really, God is not looking at any of that. He's looking at, if you're a Christian, He's looking at you and He's seeing Jesus. Glory to God. And we need to feed on Jesus. In other words, that breast, remember we talked about was the source. That was the all-breasted one that we talked about being the source. And we need to feed on the love of God. John, there again, leaned on what? His breast. Glory to God. He was leaning on the love of Jesus, the love of, that Jesus had for him. And we need to feed on that love that God has for us. And how do we do that? Say, well, Sister Janice, how in the world do we do it? Brother LJ brought this out, and I'm going to bring it out because it's in my notes too. By looking at the cross, hallelujah, by focusing on the cross, we're eating the word concerning the cross that's eating the breast, hallelujah, feeding on the love of God, that we need to stay in Scripture that's feeding on the love of God and all the Scripture that lifts up Christ, hallelujah. Jesus said, we need to take heed, and this is what's so important, uh, Brother Kenneth, he said, take heed. What was the things that Jesus said, take heed about? He said, you need to take heed about what you hear, Come on, that's what you eat. You need to take heed about what you hear. Come on, did he say it? And how you hear it. In other words, what condition your heart's in. You need to take care and also take heed of what you hear. When you hear message after message on how you need to behave to get God to love you, you're feeding on the wrong thing. You're not feeding on Christ. And the church is malnourished and because the power that God wants his church to walk in can't walk in the power because they, they feel so condemned all the time that when they talk about people coming and laying hands on people, they're, they're pushing other people in front of them. You go, a little hands on, go lay hands on them because I think you're closer to God than I am. That's somebody who does not know that they're the disciple that Jesus loved. Come on. Well, that's where the power that's being filled with all the fullness of God and that power and anointing and laying hands on the sick that people back off from a lot of times is because they feel like their life is going to get in the way of God answering their prayer when their life is not supposed to be in the picture at all. It's supposed to be what Christ has done. It's supposed to be Christ-centered. Amen? We feed on God's love for us by looking at the cross and eating the word we're eating the word. Hallelujah. When we're, we're getting rooted and grounded in God's love is essential to experience and everything Jesus paid for. 
if we're not rooted and grounded, we won't experience it. I've known people that have lived and died and they've not experienced all that God has for them. And that was, it wasn't the will of God for it to happen that way. He said he wanted us filled with all the fullness of God. And we cannot be filled with all the fullness of God. And when we talk about that, yes, he did fill us, but we're not experiencing it, Brother Keith, because we've not feasted on the love of Christ. Our focus has been um, about how much we don't, the little children saying, Jesus loves me, this I know. And then when we get to be grown, we think, well, that's kind of silly. That's kind of silly to be singing those kind of songs, but Jesus called us little children. Come on, my beloved, my little children, that we need to be feeding on how much Jesus loves us. Not uh, songs, and I hope a lot of people uh, hear me from Facebook. They may take me wrong. I might even get a phone call on this, but about being on the battlefield for my Lord, and it's all about the struggle, and it's all about all kind of things that, you know, we're, uh, we're fighting the battle. I lost my flag in battle. My staff is in my hand. All kind of different things, and it really depicts uh, defeat rather than victory, and I got to thinking about how many songs do we have in the song book that talks about how much God loves us? And how many songs in our song book talks about our works for God? That's just what I'm, we got to thinking about. And I really couldn't come up with many in our song book of, of singing, just standing up and all together, just coming together and just singing about how much God loves us. I, co I come up with a few, but I didn't come up with very many, Brother Jerry. It was more about testimonies. I just want to stand up and testify how much I love God. And I thought about, where is a testimony? Like John said, John was testifying. He was standing up and he was saying, I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. What did that do? That kept that love right up in front of him. Hallelujah. It kept that power right up in front of him. God would do anything for him because he's the disciple that Jesus loves. He was leaning on the breast. There are people that are not only are they not leaning on the breast of Christ, they're following him afar off. They're, they're not following him up close. And it's not because God wants it that way, because he doesn't. It is essential that we know, because it is foundational, how much God loves us. The love of God and believing, the Bible says not only knowing here, but believing in the love of God is what energizes your faith. The Bible says faith works by what? Come on, holler at me. By love. Well, then I've heard a lot of people say, and they'll say, faith works by love. It's how much you love God. If you love God enough, your faith will work. No. Not about whether I love God enough that my faith will work. It's about how much do I know about how much God loves me. That's what causes my faith to work. And it's always been, it's almost like a, a spiritual dyslexia or whatever, that we're always trying to do all these things to get God to love us for our faith to work. But God has said, you've got to recognize how much I love you and your faith will work. Glory to God. That's the way God puts it. Because, And we have to have what's so, uh, so important is because it's by faith that we access the grace, which is the power of God. And we get more and more grace. The more revelations, Sister Linda, we have in the love of God, the more grace is available in our life. Grace, grace, and more grace. And it's literally like an, uh, uh, mashing your gas pedal or whatever. When you start to go over a hump, you have more grace and more grace to get over anything you need to get over to meet any problem or situation in life. But it's foundational on do you know that you are the disciple that Jesus loves? Amen. Do you know that? So knowing and not knowing hinders us from being closer to Jesus. And people, there are people that, are, that love God more, but it's the ones that have recognized how much God has loved them. 
My mother was one of them, and um, I was talking to her about some things one time, and there were a lot of talk about what you were supposed to wear or not wear, whether you're supposed to cut your hair, whether women were supposed to wear pants, you know, whether they could, whether it was appropriate in church, and a lot of different things like that. And uh, what she did, Brother Donald, I, I was she'd come to my house, and I was asking her questions, and uh, I said, Mama, what about this? And what she answered me was, didn't have anything to do with about all the people that was saying one thing or another. It wasn't their opinion that mattered. The opinion of the people didn't matter. She looked straight up into heaven and she said, he knows that if he was to ask me to take, to let my hair grow, she said, I'd never put another scissor to it as long as I live. She said, he knows that. If that was a requirement, he knows. It was a relationship that my mother had that when I had issues, Brother LJ, stumbling around as a young Christian, my mother went on to be with the Lord, and I was, I was a young Christian. And as I was stumbling around, you know what she said to me? She said, you haven't seen the eyes of Jesus yet, have you? You've never seen the eyes of Jesus. She said, when you see the eyes of Jesus, you're going to see pure love. It's not going to be what you think. I didn't see condemning eyes. I didn't see eyes that were ashamed of me. I didn't see eyes that didn't want to be close to me. But when I seen his eyes, and I did, thank God, I seen his eyes in a vision. And when I seen his eyes, it was full of love. And it was full of acceptance. That's what John saw. And that's why he declared he was the disciple that Jesus loved. The only thing, glory to God, the only thing that will get rid of, and I want to talk about this, the two big things that will keep you from being close to God, how many of you want to know what those two things are? The two big things that will keep you from being close to God is pride and fear. Those are the two biggie things. And the only thing that will settle Either one of them, the only thing that will overcome pride and fear in your life is having a revelation of the knowledge of the love of God for you. Only thing that will fix it. The only thing, people say, well, I've just got a problem with this right here. I've got a problem uh, with fear. I've talked to a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of people that were fearful, and they just, when they prayed, they didn't know whether they was going to get an answer or not. They, they thought, I don't, I don't know if I'm, God's going to hear me or not. And that's why, you know, let me just be honest about this real clear. Let me be clear about it. That's why people call so many people to pray for them. Because they, they don't think they can get a prayer through. And there's nothing wrong with calling somebody and join, getting somebody to join with you. But when you think you've got to have 7,000 to do it, well, I've got to get as many people as I possibly can to join with me to make sure God answers this prayer when it really doesn't take but you. All, you. all you have to do, because you are, and we need to see that, that God loves this world, but he individually loves us. I am the disciple that Jesus loves. Come on, let's say that tonight. Come on, I am. I am the disciple that Jesus loves. Right in the middle of your mess. Anybody ever messed up in the last 30 days? Come on. I am the disciple that Jesus loves in the middle of the mess. Come on. Amen. <clears throat> Somebody say praise God. Hallelujah. I, we need, I need, we need revelation and the knowledge of him because great peace is meant for us. Great love is meant for us. Health is meant for us. John said, I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Great joy, exceeding great joy, unspeakable joy. How many people do you know of that has exceeding great unspeakable joy? Come on, they're walking in exceedingly great unspeakable joy. And all of it comes from revelation of the knowledge of how much God loves us. And that's what Paul is saying. And that's what he said in these prayers to the, in the Ephesus. He's saying, when you know that you're blessed because of how much God loves you and not because of everything you've done, he said, your faith will go through the roof. That's the one thing they lacked. They did not have, Sister Linda, revelation. And so many people have, have said such things like, well, if... if 
if so and so was to leave me or, or uh, a mate or whatever died that I would I would never be able to make it I'd never be able to to get along if my if my husband died I just don't know what I do we do not need to put our heart into another person's hands our heart needs to be in the hands of Jesus the ones that loves us more than any body else and we need to know it I, I believe we need to get up every day we need to get up every day I'm going to uh, issue you this information and 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 I pray that you that you take some some spiritual advice tonight and start seeing yourself as a disciple that Jesus loved get up in the morning and say I'm the one I'm the favorite I'm the favorite hallelujah that's the people the devil wants you to worry about what's next. In our world, there was much mention in prayer and all over this world, people are praying against things that are ungodly, and absolutely we should. But the devil wants us to worry about, and here's what he wants you to worry about. What's next? Come on. What's next? That's what he wants you to worry about. But the Bible says, casting all your care upon him. Why? He cares for you. Casting all your worry, all your fear, all, all the care, get rid of the spirit of fear, casting all your care on him. Because if he can get you to worry about what's next, and that's always what he's about, what's next, well, what, what can we expect next? I'll, how many times have you heard people say, maybe said yourself, well, I wonder what's next? Come on. That's what he does. Why does he do that? Because he can in that way, if he gets you to worry about what's next, you won't enjoy your now. And that's what God came for you to have. Jesus came so you could have and enjoy your life now. Hallelujah. Don't fret means don't worry. Don't allow anxiety to remain and reign. God said don't even let it in you, but don't let it remain and don't let it reign. Do you know prolonged worry, fear, and anxiety will affect your health? It will steal your life. And the only thing that will stop fear and worry and pride, all these things, the only thing that will do anything about it is revelation and the love of God through Jesus Christ. And the only way you're going to find that out is go to the Word. Go to, come on, go to the Word. Eat the Word. In other words, you're eating Christ. You're eating the Word on the cross, the sacrifice that He made for you, until you get established, until you get rooted and grounded in the love of God to where you can't be blasted off of it. Here's what will happen. At that point, it will turn fear away. You won't have to worry about fear. It will defeat pride in your life because you'll realize that Jesus loves me. And Brother Donald, the Bible says that when we were dead in trespasses and sin. God loved us. I believe that's Ephesians 2 and 8. I want to go there before we close tonight. Uh, the song that Brother Billy sung on Sunday morning, when he was talking about the goodness of God, that's a, that's a good song on the love of God. Um, another song, Amazing Love talking about how much God loves us. Hallelujah. Another song was, Nobody Loves Me Like You. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Another song that I found, which was a, a gentleman that was singing this, and he, right by himself, I thought, that's really good. And it was, Oh, How He Loves Me. It wasn't, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And that's a great song. I do love the Lord. But I love Him because He first loved me, right? I can't love him if he didn't first love me. But oh, how Jesus loves me. And that's an awesome thing right there. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? It is the gift of God. Hallelujah. When we were dead in trespasses and sin, the Bible says God sent his Son. That's God's love. Hallelujah. God so loved me. Hallelujah. It really is all about Jesus. It really is all about eating Christ. Hallelujah. It is about digesting the word. Hallelujah. And the scriptures that talk about the sacrifice. Amen. 
it talks about the sacrifice. Glory to God. Let's let's do one song, Brother Jerry. Can we do that and have the musicians come up? Um, I think Amazing Grace is good. Hallelujah. That, I think that's a good one right now. Because we need uh, all the singers. Uh, y'all y'all come up, Brother Kenneth and all of you, Brother Keith. Okay. Brother Jerry's going to uh, come up after this. Um, Brother Jerry, I think, Brother Billy, you do Amazing Grace and Key of F, is that right? Or G? All right, the Key of G. Brother Billy's going to lead us in Amazing Grace, and Brother Jerry's going to come. Hallelujah. Think about it. Just getting up in the morning. Looking yourself in the mirror, Sister Nelia. Say, I'm the disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm the one. I'm highly favored and loved by God. He died for me. Nobody ever loved me like Jesus. Boy, that'll make your day change, won't it? And you just go throughout your whole day thinking, oh, how Jesus loves me. Oh, how Jesus loves me. Thank you for loving me, God. Let's just, let's practice that over and over again. Lord, thank you. Oh, how he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Amen. Let's just sing it. Jesus loves. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Brother Jerry. Thank you.